All right, how about Columbia, South Carolina? I'm going there. All right, welcome everyone. I saw this mic, I like it. I like the mic, sorry. <laughs> uh, I want to welcome everyone to District 1, um, and I definitely want to um, welcome our mayor, Mayor Rickerman, and Dr. Bustles, Councilwoman Dr. Bustles. Um, I want to commend the mayor today. You know how traditionally we used to do the state of the city, um, which was so exciting. Can I say that? <laughs> um, and so one thing about um, the mayor's entrepreneurial spirit, you know, he's a serial entrepreneur and he likes to try new things and he tries to get us as the city to do different things. Um, he wanted a different approach to the state of the city. And he said, instead of bringing everyone to one place, how about do a tour and go to the different districts? And so our first stop, luckily we're number one. So the first stop is here in District 1. I love the idea. Um, and then this also allows us to hear more about our district and what's going on here, which I think is super fabulous. Because sometimes we kind of get all in the mix. So I want to welcome you all. I want to welcome every one of you for coming. I'm glad you all came. I think this is going to be fun. Um, and then I am going to turn it over to me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Aditi Bustles. I have the pleasure of representing the entire city as one of your at-large council members. But District 1 has a special place in my, in my heart, because many of you know, I probably would have walked here if I wasn't going to show up sweaty. Um, Earlwood is my hood, mm -hmm. and I really love the growth and the vibrancy of our district. So excited to be here with you all and talk about all of the work that we're doing. And also want to really commend you know, Mayor for all of the great work that he's done, just jumping right in. And I think what's been pretty evident that you'll notice in our city council meetings as well is that the process has been very collaborative. You know, we all have a say, we all, he listens to all of our opinions and perspectives uh, while making a decision. And there's so many projects that we get to work on truly together. And so the, the things that you saw scrolling uh, on the PowerPoint is just a snippet of the things that we've accomplished in the last you know, year and a half. And I can, I can speak on behalf of council that we are all very passionate about making sure that our districts, whether it's District 1 or District 4, have access to the same opportunities and have you know, the same kind of strategic vision of being this vibrant, beautiful city. So very excited to participate with Mayor Rickman, and I will pass it over to him. Well, thank you. Welcome, everybody, and, and welcome to the first of five town halls. As we said, we were going to try something different, and, and part of it is coming and really being in a district and having the opportunity to sit in front of you. I know we sent out and we tried to send out some, some information to get some questions before. We do have cards here tonight so that if there's something that you hear about, see about, suggestion, opportunity, or anything, please share it with us. We'll, we'll get back to you in writing so that you have that, but we want to make sure that we're continuing the dialogue and part of getting away from the standard state of the city was really to, to have an opportunity to really sit down and, and have an open conversation. And I think this is what we're trying to do. Um, you know, town halls always are, I think, the best way to approach and engage uh, our community. And, and, you know, coming here, and I, we use the word we a lot, um, and you'll hear all of us say that. It's, it's, not, it's not me, it's not Tina, it's not Oddity, it's not Howard. It's not Will, it's not Peter, it's all of us combined, Reverend McDowell, all of us combined working together, communicating, and really advocating for a city as a, as a whole. And, and when we say we, we also include you all, because you're part of the puzzle. Um, a lot of the things that we're doing today that you'll hear about in the general discussion of the city, but then also as we continue to talk about the district, a lot of it's from, from input that we get from our community. Um, and look, we're human, we're not perfect. We still got a lot of things to do, but our goal is to collectively bring everybody together and make this the number one city in South Carolina. Not based on population, but based on livability. And I think we're doing that. As you've seen, we've gotten some, some nice uh, shout outs from various groups saying this is the best place to live in, in South Carolina. 
I believe that. I think a lot of people believe that. But we have to continue to push that forward and work together. So tonight, you know, it, we as we mentioned, we had sent out some stuff. So we got a few questions that we'll talk about later on. But I'm going to start off with talking a little about citywide. As we keep continuing, Mayor Benjamin coined One Columbia, and I still believe that. We are One Columbia. We've adapted a little of this open Columbia from the sense of that we're open for ideas, we're open for business, we're open up for innovation, but we're also open for criticism. And to know how we look at it, criticism to us, sometimes people say, well, that's, that, that's a complaint. I, I take it as a compliment. Because if you didn't care, then you wouldn't have told us. You'd have just put it on the internet, we'd never be able to solve something. So I always encourage people, if there is something that, that you see that we're not doing, please engage with us. But every business, public service, neighborhoods, district, law enforcement, firefighters, government officials, schools, churches, citizens, are all part of this city. You're all part of the puzzle. And we can't talk about one without the other. Can't talk about strong neighborhoods without strong businesses. They, they have to coexist. And we're in a heart of a great historic district. And we're going to continue to make that district stronger and better and part of it. And we're seeing that growth. You're seeing things happen here. Um, but we can't do it if we don't have a united team. And, you know, part of our job at the city is laying the groundwork for growth, um, developing our community, bringing people together in partnerships. Collaboration was one of the negatives that we heard for a long, long time in Columbia. And I think we're trying to do more collaborations so that we're working together, trying new approaches. We're going to continue to try. But a lot of these approaches, as I said, are community-led initiatives. And we're going to continue to grab on that and grow with that. But the city of Columbia shouldn't be doing everything. We should be the seed, the uniter, bringing people together and spurring those ideas. And you know, maybe replant the seed, but somebody else minds the you know, takes care of that garden and grows that, that idea. Um, but we, us as council, city council, can't do it without all the magical people here. So I'd like an opportunity before we sit there and move, before I move forward, really, I'd like all the city staff to stand up because I think y'all deserve a, uh, a round of applause for all y'all do for us. Without our city staff, without the uh, colleagues on council, we wouldn't be moving things forward. We're going after long projects that have been out there, but Spindley Park, the Vista Greenway, access to the riverfront. We have this beautiful, th I mean, not many communities have three rivers that come together, and for a long time we've had limited access. And opening that up, that also helps with our tourism. Y'all know we get 16 million visitors a year in Columbia? 16 million but only five and a half spend the night. So, you know, one of our things is continuing to open up and give people reasons to spend the night here, spend more money in our restaurants and retail and be part of it. But you got the Bull Street District, which now hopefully as we talk about the connectivity that we get on the Main Street corridor to tie our historic neighborhoods, suddenly you tie Elmwood, uh, Earlwood and Cottontown, with Bull Street, you bring the rest of Maine from our other historic neighborhoods and bring them into the community to support those businesses that are here and growing. We're getting more restaurants. I bring people on Main Street all the time in this corridor to show them where the opportunity is because I don't know that there's another place that has opportunity as there is right here in our backyard. There's not a lot of places a small business could go, plant their seed, and be able to see the state house. I challenge people to find somewhere else in the southeast where you can do that, and it's still affordable, livable, and you're surrounded by great neighborhoods. You now we continue to try to do things like we brought together Love Your Brock grants, trying to put community pro promotions back in, giving people opportunity to work with their neighborhoods to improve signs. Um, you know, we're changing out lighting. We're doing all these things where we can, but we also want to help the neighborhoods do their part, which is give them the seed money, public art coming down the road, which we're really, really excited about, and bringing that to all neighborhoods, not just the Main Street corridor or our main entertainment districts between our traveling art programs, which we'll talk about more. But if you look at the items that we saw up here tonight, the, I mean, it's just a sampling of what it is, and it's hundreds of millions of dollars 
thousands of hours of staff time, lots of innovation, and we continue to do that because that's what we're supposed to do. And the, what you're seeing is the puzzle being put together. We're going to stick with that puzzle theme because I think everything is about is puzzle pieces connecting people together, connecting businesses together. So let's start with public service, our essential functions. The City of Columbia is constantly working to ensure the city has a clean, safe, and enjoyable, accessible um, city. Uh, you know, we're beyond, so many people think we're just about water, but we got 911, we got street divisions, you know, we got engineering, we got solid waste, we got our billing departments, our planning departments, our fire department, our courts, planning and zoning, parking. You know, that's just to name a few. We have 17 departments that provide you some type of service in our, in our city. And I think that's very important. And I'll tell you a little sidebar. One of the things that's excited me is that we're going to do it again, but about a year ago we had an opportunity to sit down with all the, the employees in each one of these parts, especially the folks that are, are out in, uh, if they were at wastewater, the fir first people you touch with and learn from them about things that we were doing that was actually not helping them get their job done. So getting the innovation from the folks who were actually doing the job. And I think that's one of the exciting things is that, that we're getting these ideas and a lot of that's internally and from our community. And I think it's, it's incredible. You know, over the last year, we've completed water meeting project, 150,000 meters. We have 150,000 water customers in our system. That really helps our community grow because that's an economic engine. We, we've upgraded to the digital units, continuing to deal with the backlog. When we started a year ago in February, hey, Miss Gale, uh, um, when we were in February, you know, we, we, we did a press conference and we came together and said, hey, we got a problem here. We, got, we have all these backlogs, but this is how we're going to deal with it. And we've done that, we've chopped that down, and that was innovation from contract extensions, working with small businesses, but also listening to our staff. How can we make things better? Flex hours, how we lower those. I mean, I know a lot of people ha have seen it, they, where we have an issue with, with customer service, and they, and they call, and we've been driving those, those call times down and getting people's problems solved quicker and faster by listening to the employees who are actually there working, not trying to do it from, down the street. So all of that is said, and that's a large part uh, of our responsibility as, as council. Um, every day these public servants are in our departments, they're working hard to ensure that everything's done effectively and efficiently, and we're giving them the tools. We're investing in the city. That was part of the vision of council, was to make sure we invest in the city. Investing in our employees, not only by bringing everybody in to their compensation, and to a competitive compensation, but giving them the tools, the technology, and the training to actually do their job with the autonomy to do that. Then obviously the biggest part of our, our responsibility is making sure our city's safe. And, and in today's world, a lot of that can be challenging. Thank God we have a chief and a police force who are dedicated to you all. I would go behind each and every one of those, those officers any day of the week to support them because I think what they do for us is incredible. They deal with more issues than any other police department there is. And they're doing it, quite frankly, shorthanded. You know, today it's much harder to recruit for police officers, but we're getting better by reaching out and talking to folks and giving them, doing the things to improve the quality of life of each one of our officers. Now, it's not just pay. It's, it, it's about having the ability to know that, that people support you, are giving you the technology and the training to do your job the best that they can. And they're, they're spending a lot of time. And I know that, that, that we continue to prove that, and we hope we can continue to prove that, but we're making the investments. You know, obviously, we did our gun violence assessment action plan that came out um, back in August of 2023, you know, just a, a month ago. And I'll tell you what's so exciting about that is that was driven by our staff. That was done in our police department with the technology, the logic, the, the records that, that they're keeping to do what on a national level people pay lots of money for. And we talked to a consultant and he said, I don't need to come down there. You've already got everything at your fingertips. 
But what's great about that, that allows us then to move forward and continue to really have an opportunity to take those issues and address them where they are. We know exactly where our issues are and how they are, so now we can start getting to the root, which is you know, the people, places, and behavior that allow us then to do prevention, intervention, and ultimately sometimes enforcement. Real Crime Time Center. We got a Real Crime Time Center where we now our cameras and the cameras that get hooked in from different folks and businesses, we now can see things at a live time. And we're growing that system throughout the city and everywhere so that we can have folks monitoring so that we can help prevent and create intervention opportunities. Obviously, you know, we began Hope and Order. Hope and Order is our our plan to tie into an overall homeless plan where we are trying to improve, improve, improve the quality of life for our residents, take care of the unsheltered at the same time. But we're at a tipping point, and I think we have to be honest with ourselves. We're there at that tipping point where our residents and our our businesses and others are getting to the point where, hey, we need to do something different. We need to address this differently. And it started off with, you know, rapid sheltering, and we're working on different enforcement, working on, as you know, we close Bain's Best. We're looking at other stores. All right, how do we work together to provide that we're not helping people's addiction go on? We're reducing it. We're getting them into help and the wraparound services. Obviously, we restructured code enforcement um, and with increased uh, productivity and accountability. It's still a challenge for us in some areas, when, especially when it comes to some of the houses that we're, we have to go through a court. There's a process. We can't just go tear something down. I wish we could just go tear every one of them down and go ahead and rebuild something new immediately, but we are, we've, we've come to close to 20 uh, out of the 60 that we have pushed to get uh, demolished, and we're going into those areas and rebuilding, and we are sparking that by working with construction companies and others and mortgage companies to get first-time home buyers in, back into our neighborhood, start building it up, because a lot of people don't realize there are about 46,000 parcels of residential in our city, and 50%, no, really 53% of it, to be quite frank, is, is rental property. I'd like to see us move that up to more home ownership. And, and help people make that transition. And that's one of our goals, partnering with the housing authority. They have a, a program to help folks get through, making sure that teachers and, and police officers and young families have an opportunity to build up equity. It's the quickest way to build up individual wealth. Um, now, some people don't wanna do that, and that's okay, but we ought to make sure we have programs to do that. And then we launched the USC Ambassador Program, and it's a test model, it's a pilot for us to put ambassadors to work in areas that have rental, especially around with college students, to make sure that, that everybody's working together to make sure that trash is picked up, that neighborhoods kept clean, that noise ordinance, and, and if this works there, I think it's an opportunity for us to expand that program throughout the city to really ensure that quality of life in our neighborhoods are number one. Obviously, extremely excited about the Office of Violent Crime. Uh, our new director is, where's, uh, uh, can you stand please? This is our new Mr. Forum, our new uh, director. Uh, we're excited to have him here. Believe me, he has been on the ground running and meeting and really looking at how we take that role of being the quarterback uh, for this issue and really focus on how do we prevent. As y'all know, the majority of our shooting is, is young people between 18 and 24. Um, so the more that we can do, and that brings up a great program to just talk about a little bit quickly too, is one of the community uh, leaders came out with, a, hey, we wanna try a skilled training center. We know that there's a gentleman out of Charlotte who's got an electrical and HVAC training program. It provides tools. Well, Ms. Herbert and I met with them, got them involved in the incubator. They now got funded through a grant process, $100,000 to give scholarships 
to folks in 29203 and parts of 29204 that may not have had an opportunity to get this type of training, which will allow them, A, to get a job the day they graduate, but also it gives them an opportunity they can start their own business. They actually lead with a full tool set to give them the up in, in their opportunity to go. It's been a very successful program in Charlotte and we're excited that we have it here, but that came from a kitchen table discussion. Mm -hmm. And so when we say everybody's part of the puzzle, we mean it. Um, obviously, you know, we, we had an opportunity to partner with Richland One in the governor's office to uh, do the Jobs for American Graduate program. It, the only program we had in Richland One was at C.A. Johnson. We now have it in every high school in our city. This program is an incredible program, and I'll, I think Richland One would tell you it's, it's probably their, their best program that they have, their Blue Ribbon program. It's got about a 92% success rate, and it follows kids from their freshman year until their freshman year in college. That program is a, uh, it, it takes kids that may be challenged in school and helps make sure that they're getting the extracurricular help that they need, the guidance that they need, opportunities to do internships, opportunities to have jobs, but they also will chase them down if they don't show up to school and make sure they get back into school and that they're, they're part of that program. And we're excited about it. The governor put a challenge out for the first 25 schools to sign up, he would pay for 75% of it. Well, I signed up eight of, eight of our schools for it uh, immediately, and then we got Richland One and the City of Columbia signed up, and we put, we made the difference of the 25%. Obviously, the fire department is the other key to our public safety. Uh, you know, obviously, we inspect every school, every apartment and complex, and we do every business, and and they do that not to be a hassle, but to prevent to make sure that when you start your business or you move into that apartment that it's safe, it has the monitoring that it needs, if it's the carbon monoxide, if it's uh, our um, smoke alarm, which I have to brag, they gave over 227 free smoke alarms and installed them for citizens in this community in the last 12 months. And obviously the city council, we've invested, we, we have invested in, in our firefighters from equipment needs. It took us a while to get there, but we, we got second gear for them. We're working on a new fire station. We're working on, we have now a consultant that we brought in to help us look at where we need to make the best investments, not only to make sure our firefighters are safe, but our citizens are safe. And then obviously, you know, we, we approved uh, the pay raise, which I think was very important uh, in this in this era more than e there ever is. Um, our next big one is obviously homeless initiatives. And, you know, we opened the rapid shelter with a place to say, all right, we got to start tackling the unsheltered. We got to find another place that we can get folks in there. Where's Miss Kamisha? Miss Kamisha, we stand up. That is our director of homeless services right there, Miss Heppard. And I'm going to tell you, she jumped into this saddle last. Uh, September and took it by the bull by the horns and has done an incredible job and we're still continuing to move that needle but that's another reason council said hey we got to move forward we have a, we have some money that we can use for this let's get this done the city manager and her team were able to get us 50 pallet homes built up and set up in 65 days 65 days so that we can make sure come November we had an opportunity to get folks into those pallet homes and begin the, the ability to get around rapid services and really make a difference. Obviously we're working on trying to do some collaboration around serving of the food, trying to get people into a safe environment where we have bathrooms and a kitchen and HVAC and out of the elements for two reasons. One, I think it's a much safer place for people to get a meal and have a bathroom and feel dignified sitting at a table and enjoying it, but also gives us an opportunity to reach out to those folks and see, is there anything we can do to get them one step closer into, into service and get wraparound service, help them get, make sure that they have their IDs and the things that they need to make sure that they can get their benefits and then we can take that from there to get them into temporary housing and hopefully permanent housing with an opportunity 
to get job or if they have mental health issues, can we help get them to the right clinician, get them into a program or addiction services, uh, which is, is a big part of that population. Obviously, our whole goal at the end of the day really is long term, let's build a one-stop shop. And when I say that, a one-stop shop that doesn't interfere with residents, it doesn't interfere with businesses, but it provides the necessary services. And we say that we're talking about something that has urgent care, that has physical therapy, that has clinicians on staff, that has catering opportunities and temporary, more permanent addiction and mental health capacity for, for guests to stay in their own room and get the treatment on, a, on an ongoing basis, along with the ability to, to get outside and, and share, but get all the services. We talked to DMV about bringing in uh, the emer uh, emergency services so that the people can get their IDs on site. Right now, volunteers take people on an individual basis, and that usually is a four-hour process to do that. Think about if we could do people as they come in and get them everything they need, DHEC in the next room, so if they need a birth certificate or anything so that they can make sure, because 54% of the homeless population in our community are from here. That we know today. We still are, you know, we still have a service that we also help um, get people transportation to go back to their community where they may have a, a family member or somebody there that can help make sure that they're getting into the process. And I'd love for Dr. Bussells, who, who uh, headed up our homeless task force, to add anything to it and then obviously follow up from our district rep as well. Well, I think that this has been the top of the mind issue for many people. I often say that we get we used to get more calls about this than your water bill. Um, and because the problem is real, but it's complex, and I want you to know that we have addressed it in a very intentional way, but the work is still going. And what you all can do as you're learning this information is first of all, share that we have this resource available, right? In the past, it had always been, we don't have enough beds. Well, I can tell you that there have been some nights that there have been pallets open, and no one has taken those beds. And so what that's saying is, there's another issue of maybe lack of knowledge, or uh, you know, more, I think complex issues like lack of trust or what we often see, which is co-occurring, mental health, addiction, criminal activity. So when that happens, it's gonna take all of us to really make an effort to change the culture of helping our neighbors and also reporting when you see illegal or criminal activity so that we can do our job and help keep our communities safe. The process of us getting to the rapid shelter, I want you to know, was one that we took a lot of input from our providers, from all of you. I remember coming to Elmwood's uh, meeting uh, early last year and we talked a lot about some of the issues that were being faced. Um, we, we, talked, we met with our, our Main Street businesses, Five Points. We learned from business owners, we learned from providers. We talked to our local um, housing and urban development. So it was really a way for us to gather information and truly understand what was happening. We even looked at the 2013 Homeless Committee's recommendation, and unfortunately, a lot of those strategies had not been implemented, or if they had, they weren't working. And so we hope that through this approach, where we are providing that quick, rapid housing, we're able to get folks to a safe, single occupancy space, right? One of the things that we learned was that that traditional shelter model doesn't always work for people. They don't necessarily want to be. Who wants to be in a room with 100 other people, right? Uh, especially when you think about some of the trauma or some of the other experiences that they may have had. And so to have this opportunity to have your own space, and I want to note that the company that we work with, Pallet Shelter, it's actually uh, owned and uh, led by those that formerly experienced homelessness. And so they, they, they say that they lead and design with dignity in mind when it comes to building these uh, structures. And so uh, I'm very glad that our, our city staff partnered with an organization that truly understands that. So the work really continues uh, in terms of addressing some of the different facets, but we can't do it alone. And that's something I wanna reiterate. We're doing our part. We are trying to look at ways in which we can improve some of the maybe the litter that we see after uh, meal sharing, looking at ways in which we can advocate to the state house uh, in terms of getting more funding for that one-stop shop, looking at ways in which our um, programs are federally funded. And is, is there an opportunity for maybe the city of Columbia to get a specific allocation from HUD to support the work that we do? And so uh, that, while that work is ongoing, I just hope that you all 
see and understand that this is a larger issue that through our work, we're hopefully raising the awareness and the need for accountability and collaboration when it comes to all of the different groups that are working to try and address this problem. Um, I totally agree, and, and speaking of complex conversations, it's a complex issue. Um, and I always say if anyone says, if we just do this, then they don't understand the complexity of the issues. And I wanna commend, like you said, the, um, the crew from Elmwood Park, because we just met last night. And the city has been reluctant, I think I can say, to be you know, really hands-on involved in the homeless issue. And this is our first time really taking the reins on, because it is a complicated issue. Um, but what I do like about, because we have done this, then Kamisha and um, the residents at Elmwood Park could have a real dialogue last night. Um, and it's a dialogue, it's a discussion where we get suggestions and input from the neighbors um, who are really being impacted by it. So I think one of the best things that has come out with it is that it is now a community conversation. Mm -hmm. um, the problem has gotten a little, um, we, I don't wanna call it a problem, but we're having to deal with it a little more. And so more people are now concerned and more people are involved in the dialogue. And to me, um, I think that's wonderful because more people understand that we cannot solve this by ourselves. I mean, we're bright, but we're not the brightest, right? <laughs> and so I think, but we, but we know that, you know, like we know that. And so we want the experts, we want the commissions, we want the folks who know um, this business or this area so they can guide us through the process. So I, I don't want to commend us, but I just want to make note that we have tackled, and I think I said last night, you know, this is a hard issue. We tried, we, the city fought trying to get involved with homelessness. Um, but we realized if we didn't do it, who else was gonna do it? Um, and so we know it's not gonna be easy. We hope that you all continue to work with us um, and Dr. Bustles and, and you know, Daniel, I'm sorry, Mayor Rickman came in. <laughs> sorry. No, I mean, but when he first came in, that was one of the first things you did. You had a task force to figure out what are we gonna do with the homeless issue? Um, and so I commend you for that as well, but um, it, it, you know, we can't do nothing. And sometimes people, you know, we get complaints one way or the other, but we can't sit back and do nothing. And so I do ask for everyone's patience and just to see how this goes, trial and error. Um, and Daniel, as I, I, I like, I don't know why I like calling you a serial Because you know me too long. Yeah, but what he knows is you try something and if it doesn't work, you learn from it and then you try something else. Um, and I think that we're fully prepared and I would just add one, one uh, short thing is some of the wins that we've seen are not monetary, right? Sometimes you can throw as much money as you want to a problem and it's still not gonna solve the problem. So one example I'll give you is as a result of the task force, um, the Richland Library uh, convened a kind of follow-up and brought a lot of the providers that work with different populations within the unsheltered population or homeless population together. And they had some, I think they had a come to Jesus moment where they realized we're not collaborating. We're all doing our own little thing and our own little piece of the puzzle, right? And we're not talking to each other. And I, I, I give that credit of that conversation and realization uh, to the city getting involved in this work and helping people recognize that sometimes we can just, you know, keep things status quo and get too comfortable and realize and not realize that things are working. And so some of those things are happening as well. And so I always try to look for those small wins along the way as we're trying to address this problem. Thank you all both for, for being part of it because it takes all of us and we've had to, to make some tough stands and there's gonna be a point that we're gonna continue to have to reach out to you, our, our community to help support us as we make some changes. Uh, some changes to try something different because what we're doing or what's been going on it, it's not working and, and we're seeing that um, and we just we've got to be innovative we got to try but we got to make sure that what we're doing is taking care of the unsheltered and providing the quality of life for each one of our residents and our businesses it, it, it is a two-way street it's not one way it's a two-way and that's been a little bit of a challenge for us, to be quite honestly. There's been some folks who think it's only one way, and it really has to be two ways, because at the end of the day, we're responsible to make sure that we take care of human lives. 
what I don't ever want to see happen again is what happened the other winter where we had somebody freeze to death because they were outside. And the worst part of it is, is they had an opportunity to stay in a hotel and they wouldn't take it. There was no mechanism to get them to take it. They had some challenges mentally. And they found them in a parking lot in our community. That's, that's not who we are. So as we continue to do this, we're thinking really through and collaborating with experts. If it's the hospital systems we're talking to, other cities, just was at the U.S. Conference of Mayors for the Leadership um, meeting and I saw what San Diego was doing. I talked to the mayor in his homeless school. I talked to three other cities. Mayor Bass was there and talking about what the, the challenge that they had to get folks into a hotel to get them off the street, but a way for them to get, it was one step for them to be able to try to get people service and the help that they need to get off the streets and have an opportunity to have uh, quality of life. Now granted, there are folks out there who don't, don't want any of that, but we also can't allow them to endanger themselves by being out. So it's a challenge and we're going to continue to look for that solution. Obviously, you know, we've been working on greenways forever. <laughs> I feel like we've been talking about greenways and I know we're working on a connectivity point through Elmwood Park that we've been working with and um, your legislator uh, and maybe a few uh, loud residents here have uh, really been pushing, which I think it's a great opportunity for us to create that connectivity. I will tell you that, you know, with the William Street extension, we're going to have an opportunity to really have not only the commercial side on UG, but open up that whole riverfront that really has not been accessible, uh, create some more opportunities for people to enjoy the riverfront, be an opportunity for have a place where you can kayak, connect, but that will be another connected point. I think the most thing I'm really excited about it is the partnerships that we're doing. And so we had an opportunity to work with Dominion Energy. Now for the next 100 years, we have access to about over 200 acres down the river that allows us to go above Candy Lane all the way up to Saluda Shoals. And with once the uh, malfunction junction, I don't know, what are we calling the new one? It's got a new name now. I was still gonna call junction. it malfunction function junction. junction. Function <laughs> junction. Function junction. But Carolina Crossroads, thank you, thank you. So, but now, uh, the Mungo Foundation and others have been working, so now we'll be able to get from the dam all the way down. So think about this. When all of this is completed, the connectivity, you'll be able to go, if you were a visitor, you could be at the convention center and walk or take a bike and never touch a road and go all the way to the zoo, up to the dam, back to Elmwood, cross over the street and go to Warmouth or into Coffee or Curious or Curiosity. I always say Curious because I, I remember reading Curious George as a kid. Um, didn't like the big yellow hat, but I like the story. Um, but the connectivity there, and as we're continuing to, to go after grants, but making those connectivity points uh, with our canal plant um, growth, we're going to have an opportunity there to have another connected point with our alternative water source. So these are all things that we're excited about. Obviously, we're going to continue to get those river point, and part of that 200 acres is to get more places for us to enjoy that river kayaking. You know, maybe it's a, a hammock park that's out there. You know, more access for people to get there, having not walking trail, but maybe a biking trail. You know, you hear so much about these other communities that have these trails that are connected, both for mountain biking and for walking. So why can't we have that? We've got probably the most pristine water in, in the southeast. And there's not another river in the southeast that has Spanish moss and class two rapids. So let's figure out how to use that to our advantage get more people staying in hotels, spending more money in our restaurants and our retail, supporting our small businesses through tourism. We know they want to come here. Let's get them to stay. Obviously, we continue to invest in our public works. Uh, I don't see Mr. Anderson here, but um, excited about what they continue to do. We, you know, we've had several challenges, and we continue to, to do, get over that by increasing uh, buying new equipment, giving our uh, employees better quality equipment to work with, giving them more aut autonomy on how they do their job to make sure that they have the ability to do it. Uh, our animal shelter received a $100,000 grant, Best Friends grant, to continue efforts towards the no-kill center. 
This has been a hard thing for us. And we're going to continue to invest in there and do that. And as you know, we're, we contract with the county, so it's not just the city. We take care of the whole county. We're looking at innovative ways to, to work with suggestions that came from other uh, adoption agencies and from activists in our community, how they could come together and help us deal, change maybe some of our ordinances and so forth to really help us get to that point where we're really getting down, more fostering. One of the things we want to invest in is moving our animal shelter into more of a retail place so that people are more apt to go there. And, a, a, and even if they're just fostering and helping us, it keeps an animal alive. Then obviously spay and neuter program, we really got to work on that. And I think we've seen some, some aftermath from, from COVID and, and, and having to deal with that. And then obviously, you know, some of the unfortunate things that happen uh, with, with fighting dogs and so forth that you've seen on the news, obviously doing everything we can to, to improve those fines so that people really think twice before they get into that. Our forestry division, you know, continues to plant 500 trees. We're investing in our tree canopy. It's important for us to get that heat reduction down. As you know, we're about 18.5% heat heat advisory above others from that you know looking at innovative ways that we can figure out how to do trees one of the things we're going to try with a, a pilot with dominion is there's some other communities that are putting grates they build bamboo grates and they put them over the spruce trees and maple trees which cause the branches to grow out long way so you still get the canopy but doesn't grow up so that we don't we don't have to chop them in half from all the uh, power lines that we have. <laughs> so trying to find a balance between making sure we got power to everybody, but also the beauty and the full canopy of the tree. So trying different things. And obviously, you know, for 43 years in a row, we've been the uh, tree uh, city USA. Really excited about this. We're the only gold city in the state of South Carolina LEED certified. We actually are invited to go to Washington to present. I think that says something because this push for LEED certified not only came from the leadership of the, uh, of the city, but it came from our CPAC and from our employees all working together. And I think it's a testimony to our commitment to the environment as well, that we're going to continue to do things. You know, our goal is to be platinum, and we're going to continue to do that. Obviously, you know, we're continuing to work on rail, railway modernization, as we've talked about for a long time. So in 1905, there was a book called Modernization of Columbia, and it talked about several things. A central park, which we're redoing now, Finley Park, <laughs> and it talked about re, realigning the rail. Uh, we've gotten $40 million from the state so far. We are applying for the mega and infra with full support. And this will be the first project that we've ever submitted to the federal government where the entire congressional delegation signed on. And I'm talking about everybody in the entire state with Congressman Clyburn and Senator Graham getting on a conference call and pleading our case not only to the White House on our behalf, but to the Secretary on our behalf of how important this is. Because the realignment opens up our community downtown. It, it, it changes it. It, it. it opens up the whole way of bringing safety. Right now, we got cut off. There are times where we got an entire community cut off from our officers, from our fire department. We're working to change that. But it also eliminates 15 crossings. And part of that is our quiet zone project, which will go along with that, which will allow us to stretch through our city to upgrade the safety requirements around our crossings so that they don't have to haunt the horn coming through, but we also prevent people or cars from getting in a situation that turns bad. And I'll tell you why that's important. We're one of the few cities, I think we're the only city in South Carolina that's got over 60 crossings in it. But because of all the automotive that we have from the upstate to the low country going to the port, we've seen an increase of 47 per excuse me, 47% of rail traffic. Well, guess who feels that? We do. None of those cars are stopping. We're not getting a paycheck for that. We're the drive through So everything that we can do to shift some of that out of our daily lives is going to be a critical piece. Obviously, we, you know, we provide basic service driving these community improvement projects, and we're, we're still doing it. You know? I'm proud of what we've gotten going. We're not done yet. 
this, this council has more energy and our staff has more energy and I will tell you, I think we've, we've taken on so many projects and we're gonna continue to do that by finishing some of these old long projects, focusing on new and continuing to invest in the city first. That means into our infrastructure, into our staff, into our equipment needs, into our parks, into our water system, we're going to continue to do everything we can to make sure that we're doing what's best for the community and the quality of life first and foremost. And that takes time. We can't hit everything at one time, but it's also going to take us innovative. We got to be creative and leverage. And that's why we hired a whole bunch of folks to help us go after these federal grants. Next piece, obviously, communities and neighborhoods. $24 million re revitalization of our center park, which is a big, big deal. Finley Park is the center of our community and as downtown living is growing and being part of that, but what's gonna make it different? And you know, we're having a groundbreaking this week and somebody said, well, it's just gonna go back to being disregarded. No, it's not. We are, we are gonna have park rangers there. We're gonna have maintenance crews. If you look at the quality of our parks, the parks that are manned on a day-to-day -day by our great staff from Parks and Recs, are the parks where you see the most people. So we're taking exactly what we do, if it's Hyatt Park, Greenview, or wherever, doing the same thing in Finley Park and putting those bodies in there to make sure that when, if you're a resident or a visitor, you have a great experience having the outdoor. We've applied for four additional grants to go after outdoor exercising. Uh, and that would be one in each district, which would be our goal, which just creates a platform and it has a whole series of exercises that you can do out, out in the outdoors and enjoy our, our quality of life, our beautiful community. The Belfield, we heard resounding in neighborhood. We need a place where if I want to start a, a nonprofit or I want to incubate my business, I need a place to go. I need a place that I can get help. And the best way for us to do that was take advantage of a bad situation where we had a flooding at the Belfield Center in the library. We took that insurance money and now we put in our, uh, cubicles. Uh, we have two conference rooms with TVs. We got printers and copiers in there where people can come and hook up with free Wi-Fi. And that's our contribution. And you can sign up and be part of that. And you have an opportunity to be there for a year. So you have an opportunity to grow your idea, your small business or whatever, but right there in the back of your neighborhood. And I hope this is the first of many that we do across the city, but this was our pilot because we saw the opportunity to take advantage of a flooding and really turn it into something that could make a difference. Obviously, we continue to do partnerships. Walmart has come through with the police department and their, and their uh, pedal initiative, they give away 50 bikes two years in a row to kids who were on the honor roll who made that at each and worked with the elementary schools. And I tell you, it's one of the greatest things to go and see a kid who may not have had a bike before, learn how to ride, put that helmet on, and have an opportunity to be outside and enjoy our community, all provided by partnerships. Obviously, the sports clinics, over 500 youth uh, have pro been uh, worked along with, with our parks and recs in the Under Armour. Uh, we have over 1,400 kids participate in the summer camps. If you saw our guideline this summer, we had a three-page folder with just, I mean, everything from arts to sports. I mean, we were, we put a stake in the ground and we have been part of trying to give people an opportunity to have a place to go and do something constructive and learn. We're also, we did a youth program through a private grant where we paid kids to help clean, clean up a neighborhood. Bless you, we, to clean up a neighborhood. And I'm hoping that could turn into a long-term program where we can hire youth and pay them to make a difference in their own community where, and then they can learn part of that is can save some money, spend some money, but there is alternatives out there. Obviously, you know, we continue to house after school programs, 75 kids per week in, in five parks. And then, you know, I mean, our senior programs are pretty strong. Uh, I think we're at least, I know over 400 seniors participating constantly, and I hope we can grow that. Did y'all want to add anything? No, I just wanted to make sure people understood too, so I heard you say, 
concerns about Finley Park, we're gonna fix it up and then it's gonna fall again. I remember coming back to South Carolina and working at the courthouse and I could go and eat lunch because I didn't, I didn't have any money back. I don't have money now really too, but I mean, no, but I would bring my lunch and I would go and have lunch at the park, Finley Park every day or several days a week. And then I also remember when I couldn't do that anymore. But um, Mayor Rickman has also been very adamant about making sure we have the funding to maintain anything that we build. Um, now it's a hard, and those are hard discussions because we have areas that want new parts and new things added. But honestly, we do have to make sure that we're budgeting to maintain the things that we currently have. Um, and so those are hard discussions that we have because you know we have to um, tell some people no and some people yes, but it's what we have to do and that's why we're in this role. But I, I do want to emphasize that that is one of the things that Mayor Rickman um, has always been adamant about is making sure we have the money in the budget to maintain all of the things that we do have and that they don't fall. Um, in disarray, and then with respect to, to Belfield, just realizing there may be people in here, great ideas, but no idea where to start. Right? Don't have the capacity, um, don't have the equipment at home, and that just opens up the door um, for a lot of people who just have great ideas um, to bring those to life. And so I just, I wanna make sure that, that um, and that was, and a lot of these things, so let me tell you what Mary Rickman is not saying. A lot of this stuff is just his idea, okay? And he's saying we, right. Um, but I think it is important for folks to know um, some of the things that he's spearheaded. So, and I'm not trying to make, I'm not trying to lay your head up. But I just want to make sure we know these things, but I think it's not always clear to everyone else. It takes all of us, and, and all of us to work together. And I think it's so important that we continue to, to do that. I appreciate the kind words, but it really is all of us working together. And I think that's what's been so exciting about mm -hmm. the last 18 months. Obviously, we talked a little bit about Love Your Block. You know, 12 neighborhoods were given up uh, recipients of grants this year. You know, community block grant money, 130 units, 20 homes repaired this year. I mean, we're there. Next next week, towards the end of the week, we're going to do the Columbia Art Streams Initiative, announcing increase in public funding in, in the city. But part of that's also bringing some libraries some libraries into our communities, a traveling art program on campus that will go through every district. So it's not just here and it'll be moving around and then our fish art project to put pride and some, mm -hmm. some thought around the river, but that being all, all those being auctioned off and that money going into a fund so that people can apply for grants to do more art in our community. Obviously, you know, we have a relationship with the Boyd Foundation who is investing millions in our community. Folks, and if you don't know who the Boyd Foundation is, it's a family here in town, and Mrs. Boyd, Susan Boyd is the matriarch of that family. They're spending about $7 million a year in our community. They're funding the bridge connectivity in our greenways. They did the greenhouse addition at Hampton. They put a million dollars into one of the incubators for innovation to really help it going. They're a major player on what's gonna happen on the riverfront and its park. But they've made a commitment to their hometown city. They're putting Boyd Island together with outdoor art and the connectivity. This is all being funded by them. They just finished paying for all of the renovations at the aquarium at the zoo. This family is committed to, to our community. And so if you ever run into them, tell them thank you. But they're continuing to do that. Um, and I think that's a great program. Obviously, talking about programs, the Shine program where we've been repairing elderly and disadvantaged homes, we had a program out there and we have really made a huge dent. We're gonna continue to search for more funding to keep projects like that going and leveraging the federal grants. And we talked about hiring people to help us with grants, that's why. There's so much federal money out there, but it's not formula-based, it's application-based. So we've got to go actively and get it. And some of it we've got to get creative on how we do it. So we're going to continue to do that. Obviously, you know, food insecurity, it's on everybody's mind. We've been talking about it. And, you know, we, we, we funded at one of the committee's uh, programs uh, to fund a mobile cart unit out there. Um, 
we're going to try the try something innovative with Instacart. Instacart and I are, are partnering up to do free delivery to folks, and we're going to do a pilot program here. And, and if it works, it could turn into a national model, which is very exciting. Um, they have been talking about this, and in October, we're going to have a big announcement about the program. We put some seed money up, but they're bringing a lot of money and innovation and support behind this so that we can try to make an impact in the short term till we can get the grocery stores in the areas in need. And it's not an easy task. You know, I know a lot of people have said, hey, you know, y'all could just build the building and give it to them. Well, you know, we did that at Save a Lot on Harden Street. Today it's empty. And whatever we do in that instant, we have to make sure that we can support it and it stands because when that time comes, if we fail, the chances of getting it, another one is gonna be very slim. And I say that because we gotta build up density. That's why we wanna build houses back in our neighborhoods and get, get density growing up. We Two Walmarts have closed in our community. That tells you that the, the market is very delicate here. And I've heard that, and believe me, we're trying every, every chance we get to do what we can out there, but we're gonna to have to try some innovative things in between. And if there's a delivery service, let's take advantage of it. Let's see if that can make a difference between somebody having to take a bus, two buses to get food, depending on somebody else to get there so that they can make sure they're getting whatever they need from them at no extra cost to them, just what it is. So we're gonna continue that pilot, looking forward to that in, in October. And then obviously, you know, the Tom's Creek project, we talked about the trailer, that, that deal has been done. And, and I, you want to add something? You were, you were a big, big part of making sure that all happened. Well, we got a presentation today, and I'm even more excited now um, because I learned last night that they also have a grocery store downtown. I think it's 912 Lady Street. And so in them picking that location, um, we're looking at them being able to get the food from right there. Because, you know, one of the big things with smaller folks is, is how do you handle the margins? Because it's really hard to open a grocery store. So um, the city staff has done a great job in picking a company that's sustainable, that's been in the market for a while. They know what they're doing. And they're getting food from local farmers that they're already working with. So I think y'all are going to be super excited when it, when it comes out. Yeah, you know, we we talked about investing in our communities and the business and everything, but we're also empowering our city workforce, and we talked about it a little bit, but market salary adjustments were very important for everybody, not just our sworn uh, officers, not just for our fire department, but for everybody who works and continuing in leadership development. Uh, working along with the city manager to really create a program where we can have an opportunity for our future leaders to grow up in our system here in Columbia. Technology, we're working on technology and upgrading, making it easier for you to get information, easier for us to get information to you, and easier for us to get back to you in a timely manner so that we make sure that we're answering problems in a very short window instead of it taking longer for us to respond. Obviously, we're, we made a big push to consolidate our offices. We're going down, we're going to put 17 properties downtown Columbia back on the, the tax rolls. Um, and we're consolidating our employees into offices so that they can then work closer together, but also get, bring a more sense of community, but also we don't need all this space. We don't need to have all these, all, let's get put money back on the tax rolls or if we have an opportunity to use that particular piece of property for an economic development project, housing, workforce housing, or a new company to attract them, we'll do that. But our goal is to get those back out into the market, bring our folks in-house. Then obviously I'm gonna roll through the, the third piece because I know you'll wanna talk about uh, District 1. Um, which is economic development. And I'll tell you, I, I'm so pleased at what our staff has done, what our planning department and the city as a whole has done. You know, we've got close to $600 million worth of investment through if it's houses, multifamily houses. Um, you know, the commercial developments 
uh, obviously trade and other developments, but advancing and growing all of our hospitality districts. Um, but what's interesting about that is that we already know there are five more hotels going to be built here. We've got a whole block of Elmwood getting ready to be redone with the owners already looking to buy more property in that corridor to bring more housing. And, um, and every time I meet with this group, I get really excited about what they're bringing because they're being very innovative and thoughtful in how they can do things during the construction phase to create some fun, if it's food truck or concerts in the construction or things to try to engage the community as they're building. But they are very excited about the opportunity. We have two more projects that are coming out of the ground uh, that, that are $125 and $135 million worth of housing downtown. That's what we need for our density to build it back up. And then obviously our, our Bull Street District is continuing to grow. Um, you know, it is, is really going and uh, talked to Robert Hughes quite a bit, very excited about some of the things he's bringing. Um, we went to meet with uh, a group that's bringing a food hall uh, which is going to be exciting. Uh, but what's really cool about it, they're not just going to bring a food hall, they're going to bring a retail component where they'll have pop-up retail. So it gives an opportunity for someone, A, to try without a big or long-term investment to have uh, a retail presence. And you're seeing it nationwide and around a lot of places, and so it's exciting that we'll have a place that we can try that out. I uh, saw it in Nashville. And it was very, a lot of big retailers. There's going to be a, 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 another group coming in that's going to have 60 booths of designers. And we're talking about high dollar, I shouldn't say high dollar, but very well-known design groups who want a showroom here. They're not ready to build bricks and mortar. But it gives us access to things that are in other communities that we should have here. And it gives us a, a way to show them that we support businesses. And I think that's what's exciting. And then obviously Scout Motors come in. That imp impacts us tremendously. Um, those folks will be living in our community, but I think what was so exciting for me about the conversation with Scout was I talked to the mayor of Chattanooga and I said, DW has been there now. What it, tell me about the experience. And he said, they're incredible partners in your community. Not only do the folks live, eat, and spend money in the community. They support cultural events. They're engaged. They don't just stay in the, the plant. They're at the art museum. Their kids are playing sports. They're investing. So when they come, and another tad, tidbit that he gave me, which was very interesting, he said, if you look at VW's history, they've never closed a plant in their entire history as a company. Wow. So that shows the commitment they make. And so I think this is going to be an exciting thing for our community, not only from a job and economic, but the exposure that we're going to get as a community from that. Obviously, Office of uh, Business Opportunity, our economic work, helping not only our small existing and new businesses, um, but the relationships that we're meeting as well. So was in Washington meeting. Uh, at the White House and with Small Business Administration. And there's a couple new programs that we're going to bring to Columbia and some opportunity, some funding that we'll be able to work with our OBO office to bring and make sure that we can help our small businesses here get the funding they need to continue to grow, expand, and some even survive through a program that will help those small businesses get through. And so we're excited about those continuing conversations. Obviously, you know, we're, we're continuing to, to work with our business retention programs, our revolving loan, you know, $720,000 that we have. And we've talked about the new hotels. It's just a snapshot of our, our, uh, what we've done so far in, in that arena of economic development. And, you know, anybody has questions around that, we can talk about it. And then obviously, I think District 1. So District 1 and um, I think three areas in District 1 we wanted to talk about and kind of thing is one is public service, obviously the major water projects that we're doing. Uh, water upgrades and Riverview Terrace subdivision, that was $1.3 million. Um, cities work to coordinate with DOT to complete the construction plan of the resurfacing streets, neighborhoods. 
we're going to continue to work with them very hard on doing it. One of our plans is, as you know, 72% of the roads in Columbia are owned by DOT. Is continuing to find money to maintain, get more sidewalks, get more walkability in the community. With, with what we've seen at the State House, we're continuing to apply for more money, but working with DOT through leveraging some programs to build back America, but also the Build America Bureau that may be an opportunity for us to, to look at this infrastructure. And, and long term, it may even be penny money down the road. Obviously, Killian Creek, 5.2 million uh, as part of the Wastewater Capacity Assurance Program. The project upsize the sanitary, sanitary sewer, uh, 5,000 linear feet, 24 inch new, and that goes all the way to Harbison, to Piney Grove, uh, and that hoped to be done by summer of 24. Harlem Heights storm drainage, 6.6 uh, .6 million. Continuing to do that, and, and I have to say this note, um, and I made him put a, a thing in, Senator Scott was a big reason why that happened. He was a big advocate for that project, and you know, uh, it was a sad phone call to get from somebody who was an advocate for for our city, and especially at the state house he fought. But if it wasn't for him, obviously, you know, we we're getting new landscaping. If you notice on Elmwood, we've cut down a lot of the bushes and so forth, put low new land. Part of that is to deter people from hanging out in the bushes, but also make the appearance stronger. Uh, we've expanded the yellow shirt program to, to in that corridor. Uh, we're working on something now uh, for part of the main to help make sure that we can help support the businesses in the community here with every bit we have, not just our public safety and our public works, but some added partnerships where we can add that extra hand or that footprint there. Obviously, we continue with new pant plants and curb appeal, street division, you know, working on the bike lane additions over on Calhoun. Obviously, we're working uh, with Elmwood and through what came out of the clear dot discussions, working on some of the test sites to slow down the traffic. We hope that we can continue to push the slow, slow traffic down in our neighborhoods through DOT has come like almost 180 degrees different from where they are from allowing us to try even art on on asphalt and some other things we are looking at uh, the main street corridor to try a uh, trial to streamline and slow down the traffic move it down so that if that if we can continue the flow of traffic there then we can put bump outs some parking there on the road and what it will do is really allow us to push the growth of those empty parking lots and lots on Main Street filled with businesses so that you're getting an opportunity for everybody to connect. Um, we bring institutional investors here to look and one of the things they keep telling us is you gotta get the connectivity. Why do you have four lanes everywhere? That's not what people do today. And downtown Decatur just went through this four years ago. You ought to see all the small businesses and the connectivity. So um, we talked to the representative uh, for the area, uh, and we're going to try this project. Uh, it may not look great at first, so please bear with us. It's it's you know they put these little pops, but the 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 point is trying to get traffic to slow down so that we can we can get the growth that we want to see. Um, Do you want to add something? No, I just wanted to make sure folks, uh, the emphasis on safety and beautification. Um, I think one of the things that we recognize coming in, I guess because we all came, well, you were still there, but um, one of the new things that we really knew we had to address was the cleanliness of the city. Um, and I don't know exactly, I don't, I don't know if it was due to COVID or not, but we realized that um, we just had a lot more trash everywhere. And so making sure that there was an emphasis citywide on all of the main corridors um, to keep have them up kept. One thing too, you know, when folks are looking at where they wanna go, they're gonna look at the community and how we're maintaining it. Um, and so I appreciate the emphasis um, on beautification and especially safety. You know, obviously phase two of Hyatt Park, renovation of the baseball field, $350,000 being for that. Obviously the courts that were upgraded, part of Asia Wilson um, did renovating of the um, existing courts. Uh, you know, we're doing some, 
getting a new air conditioning. I know somebody's here from Hyatt Park, they know the air conditioner down. We're working on getting that, that fix in new park. But that park has had tremendous amount of investment over the year, really looks great. You know, Greenview, we're putting $700,000 out into there, adding trails, upgrading the courts. That's one of our busiest tennis centers in the city is at Greenview adding some landscaping so it's more attractive for those folks who are coming in to play in those tournaments to see, but adding some camera systems there for safety, upgrading the bathrooms in there so that it, it, it really is a representative of our community. Randall Avenue Park uh, development grant of um, $252,000, which is exciting because that's where we're also building homes and we've been uh, very excited. It's been a long process to get there but we'll have 12 new homes and that'll be a start. Baseball field upgrades here. That's another 300 there. Obviously, um, everybody's excited about the return of the cornbread other than a little bit of rain, but it was still fun. Uh, I still ate too much. Uh, I'm still mad I didn't win a prize for my cornbread that I, uh, I submitted. It was I good. still thought it was good. It was but, very um, good. <laughs> clearly, the judges did. Um, and then, obviously, our biggest our biggest plan is is that we're going after a choice neighborhood grant. Uh, the old East Central plan. Some of y'all were involved in that uh, in 2004. It's been sitting on a shelf for for almost two decades. It is still relevant today, and we're going to use that to catapult. Um, we're getting, we have to apply. We thought we could bypass, I'm gonna be honest with you, I thought we could bypass the, the planning grant and focus on the grant since we had this great plan, but the federal government says that's not the way they operate. So we're getting, we're going after the planning grant. We're gonna take all this information, all this hard work that our neighborhoods, our staff and everybody did and put it in for a choice neighborhood grant. We're going after 35 million. And why that's important is that we could leverage that money in the private sector then and, and really, you're talking about possibly four times that amount of money being leveraged and spent in 29203 to, to really address issues from, from I-20 to Elmwood. And that's those neighborhood nodes of corridors, getting new sidewalks, creating opportunities for small businesses and more uh, family, because one of the things we need is we need quadruplexes, townhomes as well as single family. We need a, a plethora of investment so that we can grow the community. This is where we lost our biggest population over the last decade was in 29203. So we have an opportunity to, to change that with these type of grants and leveraging what we've learned and how to go after that. And, and it doesn't hurt that we have a friend in the White House these days. So uh, thanks Mayor Benjamin for constantly taking our call and helping us where we can because it, it does help, I'm gonna tell you. Obviously, you know, our investments in NOMA uh, and, and the things that we continue to do, the partnerships with the new groups. Obviously, I mean, when I ride down here and you see what's going on with the businesses across from from uh, uh, Cromer's and next to the Trestle building. That's the kind of stuff that I wanna see more of. I think what they're doing there is not only attractive, I heard they're fully leased already, that's what I heard from somebody. So, I mean, that's incredible. That's what we need to continue to foster and that's what we can do together uh, as we continue to, to move there. Obviously, you know, paint and sip is open up. We're all anticipating, you know, peak, uh, drift opening up that that's a big deal I just had heard the other day they just signed a contract to produce beer for another company that really will maximize the growth out there which is incredible that means more jobs and then as that opens up that's another seed that's going to close these gaps that we've been trying to do for for decades obviously you know we're going 220 uh, Main Street 49 million um, dollars 250 apartments i don't know if you've met your new neighbor from from midlands media they are some of the nicest people they own kicks uh the dude i'm sorry it used to be called kicks it's the dude now but they also have cola daily they're incredible people if you haven't had a chance to meet them uh, go by and knock on their door they're going to be great neighbors and they're going to support each and every one of you um, very well and they're a good advocate 
and then obviously EPC Inc. with nine and a half million investment, 150 jobs. No, I'm just excited to see things coming. Um, and, you know, the city started with the city center and we truly are seeing that work slowly work its way down the corridor. Um, but I also like, um, so we have these plans. I always complain that we have all these plans and we spend all this money, but the plans don't come with the money to implement. <laughs> I mean, they just don't. And so being able to go back and implement some of the East Central City partnership, that, that um, plan has been critical. It, it may have taken many, many years, um, but I like the fact that we've been able to go back and fund some of those projects mm -hmm. um, and doing infill with single family homes and increasing home ownership opportunities for folks who may not otherwise been able to buy a house. So I mean, I think it's, I think it's crucial um, and I think it's gonna really impact the neighborhoods and the communities. There, and there are more projects coming. People are looking every day. Uh, and in our economic development team, we have been visiting cities and meeting with restaurant owners and retail owners and investors, but going to meet and see their projects so we can understand. As y'all know, when we, when we get apartment complexes and so forth in, we want to know that the management team understands what we expect. We expect it to be a well-maintained and part of our community, and that's what we've been doing is almost vetting people before we show them all the opportunities here. And we had some incredible visits uh, in Atlanta and Charleston and Greenville uh, and Charlotte uh, and learned some things in Charlotte where they created some, some affordable housing models that are sustainable, and they do it with, with corporate partners and they have what they call a goodwill profit margin, but they build a system so that they it's not, everything's not driven by tax credits, so they're really investing in a unit and making it stable and, and sustainable. And they're, they've done seven projects in that market so far. And the, but that's the kind of relationships we're trying to build is take the knowledge where people are doing good, sustainable projects that are community oriented and bringing those folks here to be part of our community. Um, so, you know, we've talked about a, a number of investments in, in District 1. This is just the beginning. It's just the surface. And we're going to continue to work on everything from our lighting upgrades that are going. If you haven't seen them, all of our lights are turning to LED. So that's going to be brighter and safer for some of our neighborhoods. Now, I've had some people say they don't like it bright, but I think the more we can do to deter the conversations that we're having, the information that we get from our district reps and our at large, but also our staff. I went and looked at a ditch today that somebody are having an issue with. You know, how do we make sure that these things are getting done and we get the appropriate folks to do it? And we're doing some things we probably shouldn't be doing because it's DOT property or whatever. We want to make sure that we do everything to maintain your quality of life. But so we've talked about a lot of the pieces of the puzzle on our end. Well, look under your chair. There's a piece of the puzzle there. So for us to be a whole community, you got to be part of that piece of the puzzle. So that means you got to tell us what we're doing right. You got to tell us what we're doing wrong. You need to put your input. You need to be an advocate for your neighbors, your business, and be part of the puzzle. We're all trying to be part of the puzzle. And I wish I could say I came up with this idea. I actually took it from my minister. Um, but she did such an incredible job talking about this that, that I said, you know, that really describes who we are as a community because all the puzzle pieces have different shapes and sizes, and it takes all of us to complete it. And I don't know a better way to describe who we are as a city is, is a giant puzzle. And everybody has a piece, and we're going to keep growing that. You know, Columbia, we try to say the words, you know, open for business, but the reality is we're open for innovation, we're open for ideas, we're open for input, and we're very open for criticism because we got to know what's right and what's wrong and what affects people in different. We're not, we're not living in your shoes, and so please keep that dialogue. Um, you know, I challenge y'all to stay engaged. I challenge y'all to share ideas. Um, you know, I want our community to be as strong as ever. I've never, I've been in Columbia 35 years, 
and I just feel like that when I go around in our community now, I just feel like people, I don't hear so much negative I used to hear. I hear a lot of positive people want our community to be who we can be. And I just see with the investment, I see with people making a decision to live here. You know, seven out of 10 people who are retiring from Fort Jackson are now choosing our community as their own. Seven out of 10. That's what the general told me the other night. Seven out of 10. That's a testimony. But we got to maintain the character that we have along with embracing investment in new. And there's a way to do it. Look, there are other places that have been doing it for hundreds of years. We can do it. So let's work together. I do, I, I, we did ask people to submit some questions, and I know some folks didn't. We do have cards here. I want to remind everybody, if something came up, you want to ask a more detailed question or something we didn't talk about, please submit it. We'll get it back to you. But I did want to hit a, a, a couple of, of ones that came in. Uh, Megan from District 1 asked what the status of the new trans, transfer, transfer station at Lucius Road is. Um, we're waiting on the board to update us when they're going to open that up, but it's supposed to be here soon. So we're going to put that information out as soon as we get it. I was hoping I could get it before tonight, but I didn't get it. Do you know it? Yes. Um, Answer right the there. <laughs> um, no, we were, they were trying to have it done this year. It looks like it's going to be January. Um, I don't know if y'all have noticed, but the contractor, um, they had some great, honestly, they had some grading issues. And so when they started trying to do the initial drive-throughs, um, they realized they needed to change them. The good thing is, yeah, because someone mentioned it on Facebook, um, whether or not the taxpayers were having to pay for that problem, but no, because the specs and everything were correct. The contractor is going back and looking at the grading. So it is gonna add a little more time um, before we're able to fully implement getting that up and running. So next year, January. Thank you. Hopefully. Um, I think one of the things that we also heard, uh, Mark G from District One, um, are there any plans to rectify the situation of the, of the gateway? And that's one of the things the Elmwood Gateway we're working on, not only creating a better entrance way coming in, obviously, you know, we're going to have some Elmwood uh, work going on there at the bridge here soon, but as we, as that all, but that's why you see the, what we've, the plannings we've done, we're continuing to do that. We've added some yellow shirt help to help clean up. We've been talking to some of the local businesses there as well about helping us deal with some of the loitering and other things that ha have gotten a lot of the trash and really clean up and brighten up. We've talked to the state about removing a lot of these excess signs that are there too. I don't know if you've ridden that on Bull Street, but I mean, at one time there were seven signs directing you to the State Museum and to the Art Museum. And we got these beautiful new signs there, but we still had the others but changing those out. And uh, I know Dr. Bustles has been working with our staff, MLBG and others about a nice gateway sign. So when you come in on I-26, you actually feel welcomed to our community. And you know, obviously Elmwood is a big part of that. Yeah, we're gonna, we saw some uh, preliminary renderings of those designs today. And it's more than just a sign. I think it goes back to some of our strategic priorities that come from you all, which is that if you build a place that people want to be, more people will come. And when we make some of these changes, it makes you feel more welcome and more pride for your city. And that was one of the things that I noticed when uh, you know I decided to be crazy and run for office was that there were a lot of folks that felt like Columbia was put in the real mirror and what and wasn't that destination that it deserves to be. And so that's what you're really seeing with our investment in public works and in our gateway. So yes, we will have um, some signage in the District 1 corridor, North Main corridor, as well as some of our major highway gateways into the city. We had another question that was around beautification and how people could get involved. What's our plan? Well, our plan is obviously to continue and upgrade, do more plantings, more trees, more low cover, but also engaging and working more. You know, there used to be adopt a block and adopt a highway and others, but getting more because we're getting more business community asking how can we invest cleaning up planning, but doing things that are sustainable. Other cities are doing plantings and different things that help not only deter trash from collecting because of the way of thing, but our, our year-round beauty. So looking at 
what other communities are doing and adding to that, but engaging. We've got a lot of garden clubs who have approached us who want to take on some significant intersections in the coming year and make that their project. So engaging and continuing. So it, part of it is our funding. Part of it is going to be partnerships and collaborative efforts. We have gotten with DOT on, we started with, we have nine different gateways into our community. We started with the first one, which was a project this summer of cleaning up UG Street and Gervais Street, getting them to restrike, getting, you know, it's terrible when you got a tomato plant growing up in the middle of the intersection, and every day you drive by and watch the tomato grow more. DOT, so that's, that's the kind of stuff that we want to address <laughs> because I don't care if you're coming in on Farrow Road, North Main, Monticello, or UG, there shouldn't be weeds this tall growing in our sidewalks and our main. So working with them to get the gateways, and then we're going to go after all the roads with them um, because they do control the majority of our roads. But that's, that's what we're working there. And then um, Mimi uh, had asked one of her questions. She sent several, so I'll, I'll take one of them right now. Is what strategies are you using to attract and retain all ages in Columbia. We're actually telling people about Columbia. Mm -hmm. we, we, we are marketing. We, uh, city manager helped us get a new marketing firm to go out and actually sell. We're, I have every college in this city represented meeting with me on a monthly basis to talk about how we retain the talent. And what we learn from them is that the, the young folks want to live downtown. They're not interested in buying a home. They want to walk to work. They want to walk to entertainment. But they also didn't know all the opportunities that were available for them in our community. Obviously, the military is a big recruitment because they're right here and they're coming. But the other thing is taking, we have 53 lots that we owned in the city that have been empty for two decades. We're taking those lots and building homes to attract people to move back downtown. When we're going to some, we know where people have moved to other parts of, of the, the county, and we're trying to track them back downtown to be part of our neighborhoods. So retaining is just showing people that we're making the investment, but also telling our story. Um, we're going to have a TV show that's coming here in October to film Columbia. And when I met with the, the producer of the show, he said, well, the staff wasn't really thrilled about Columbia. Uh, at first because they just thought we were just a college town. They had no idea the assets and we sent them just gobs of information and videos and showing them. They were blown away what we have and the, and, and the comment was pretty funny. He said to me, why don't y'all tell anybody? I said, I don't know, I think for years we were trying to keep it a secret, but now we're telling people so that we can make sure that we keep it. We have, we have over 60,000 students here who are future workforce. We're getting ready to have an influx of people who are probably going to come here along with the folks that are here to join Scout and some of the ancillary businesses. That's how Greenville grew. That's how other places have grown, is those folks coming. And when they come here, what do they want to do? They want to stay. I'm a prime example of that. 35 years ago, I had no desire to stay in Columbia. I'd been here for four years for college. I was leaving. It took four extra months of staying here to realize that my friends were taking jobs here, that this was a place that supported small businesses and it had an incredible lifestyle for anyone. We have all these assets. It's a beautiful city, and I still believe that. And I think we just, it's our time to shine. Um, with that, thank you all for coming. Thanks for being here. Uh, uh, this is the first one of five. Uh, we're going to continue to move around, but I hope it'll encourage you to engage with us, stay, stay in touch with us, uh, and be part of that puzzle. Thank you.